All right, great. Well, thank you. Thank you everyone for jumping on this call and uh, getting on at six o'clock if you're East Coast time. And basically, you know, we got a lot of great questions. We've had a lot of success with these kind of fireside chats that Bob and I've done in the past. And we really just tried to keep it topical. We got some great questions in from, you know, a lot of clients and, uh, you know, other potential clients, I guess, that have been listening to our content for quite a while. And I think everything that we were asked is very topical right now. Um, and it's very interesting because, you know, last time we did this, it was right before the election. And right before the election, it was a pretty tense time. And there was a big belief that the markets could just like fall off a cliff. Uh, the world was going to end. And it's like Bob likes to say, the world doesn't end very often. And here we are literally having all time record highs in the stock market. Um, and a lot of things that came to fruition, a lot of people believed would actually sell the markets off actually didn't happen, which just goes to show you um, a lot of what Bob and I had said before is, you know, really, you know, try not to focus too much on the politics. If you start looking at the economic recovery that's upon us right now, it's been pretty strong. It's been very strong. Um, and I think the, uh, the interesting thing is we, we had quite a few people who wanted to sell out at the end of the third quarter and just time the election, uh, which, so if you're a conservative and you're leaning towards, you know, being upset if there was a blue wave um, and you got out of the market, I, I ran some numbers the other day. You, you would basically have missed about a 25% move the day of the Georgia elections. Um, and you would have been right in your prediction. So what, what it turns out is, you know, predicting political events has nothing to do with financial events, evidently. So when we look at the overall portfolio, um, you know, we, we really, the diversification's really paid off because what, what we're seeing now is the market start to rotate out of just this concentration into growth. And we're seeing, you know, uh, new highs in the emerging markets and commodities, starting to see interest rates go up. We want to talk about that a little bit today. Um, and we'll weave in all our thoughts as we answer all these questions. So I think, you know, that, that's going to take some time. So Ryan, why don't we jump into the question? So let's get right to the questions. The first two questions come in, they're very similar questions. So I'm going to read them both and we'll address both of them. Um, but the first one comes in from Rufus. He writes in, what will happen to the dollar saved in the stock market when Bitcoin continues to rise? The second question comes from John. He writes in, can you address the future of Bitcoin and its exact meaning? Will it play a part in undermining, undermining the US dollar or any other current accounts? Thanks. So Bob, it sounds like Bitcoin's on a lot of people's minds right now. Well, it is. I mean, first of all, we don't own Bitcoin. So if anybody's wondering, it's not part of our asset allocation. We never trade currencies or what are masquerading as a currency. Um, it's too risky. It's, it's, it's you know, it's just, um, it's, it's impossible to, to really do well in the currency market. But when it comes to Bitcoin, uh, I never want to have an investment where you have to calls up and you say, oh, I, I lost my password and I've got millions of dollars locked in my phone. Uh, please, you know, help me find my password. I mean, whoever that poor guy is, I feel bad for him. But, you know, Bitcoin trades on its own. It's a supply and demand issue. All right. It goes up and down based on supply and demand. It doesn't go up or down versus the dollar versus the stock market versus interest rates. It's its own asset class. Uh, one, quite frankly, um, I'm not going to invest your money in, but um, and I don't think it's going to be a viable currency. And, you know, Ryan's got some good reasons for that. Yeah, just a couple of things that you hear the argument of why Bitcoin is something you should own in your portfolio. And, and believe me, we're, we're always open minded. At some point, our minds could change on it as well. Um, but, you know, you hear often that it's an alternative currency. Well, you know, a couple of the myths that you hear are Bitcoin is a safe haven asset. Well, this past year when the market sold off 30, 40 percent, so did Bitcoin. You know, it wasn't protection in your portfolio. So we can nix. It's a safe haven asset. Bob, the second myth that we've heard often is Bitcoin is a stable store of value. And last time I looked, it's volatile as hell. Yeah, very volatile. I mean, we had an 80%, 78% drop in 2018. Um, you know, so it, it really does have extreme volatility. Uh, that being said, if you bought some, congratulations, you did really well. But um, it's not something we're going to, you know, we're going to really invest in in the near future. Yeah. Um, our next question is from Barry, and he wants to know our take on inflation and debt and how that will affect the market. Well, you know, I think one of the good things about me having gray hair is that uh, I've been around a while. 
And, you know, it's been a while since we've seen inflation. It's been a while since we've seen hyperinflation, which I don't expect. Um, and it's been a while since we've seen the bond market, um, you know, do anything but go, go up. So I think we're, we're starting to see a huge move in commodities. Uh, if you look at corn, soybeans, soybean meal, copper, oil, they're, they're spiking up. And I think that's a reflection of the anticipation of inflation. And when I, when I think about inflation, the market's kind of indicating a 2% inflation rate. Federal Reserve's made a pretty clear rye. That's what they're targeting, and they'll allow it to go a little higher. But it will have a bigger impact on bonds and I think stocks, because stocks are your ultimate hedge. Well, and I think it's an important thing to have in your portfolio, and it's important to know if you're a client of our firm, is we have a lot of inflation hedges in your portfolio. Because no, make no mistake, the government's been printing a lot of money, right? We had the CARES Act last year, that was $3 trillion. Uh, then we had another $900 billion in December. Now they're pro proposing another $1.9 trillion. And then on top of that, a multi-billion dollar infrastructure plan. Actually, so multi trillion. <laughs> multi, could be trillion, could be trillion. I read billion this morning, but Bob, you know what? Okay. You're probably right. <laughs> well, so, you know, okay, right. No, 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 it's okay. So, yeah. so basically... It looks to us like, again, the market's telling you inflation's coming. If you, if you work with us, we have commodities in your portfolio, which have been going up. If you look at interest rates, they've been going up. Um, and that's why it's so important that you have a diversified portfolio because growth stocks, you know, we got to love that the Facebook, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, they've done phenomenally well, but they're not really inflation hedges and they don't pay a lot of dividends. Yeah. And, and by the way, um, near term spending is a is a stimulus for the market, you know, for stock prices to go up. Um, you know, one of the things that I read recently is that uh, one of the reasons that the politicians want the infrastructure bill is because they want the economy to be doing really well coming into midterms. So there is a political agenda, believe it or not. So, um, and that boosts our portfolio. So I'm, I'm pretty happy about that. So we'll just, um, we'll see where the spending goes. Uh, but right now with, you know, record low interest rates, and with, um, with that kind of spending, you know, most of that money's going to find its way, you know, into our financial assets. So I'm happy to see that for near term. Wow, that's news to me that politicians have an agenda. I'm, you know, I never <laughs> really get one goal in mind. Get reelected. <laughs> Pretty sweet job, too, by the way. <laughs> uh, next I question. You guys to do something different. <laughs> next question comes in. Uh, Ryan and Bob, this is from Ron simply stated where to put cash short term and long term. Well, uh, let me first... tell you, right. This is the best year to demonstrate why our strategy is the all weather strategy or A to B process of diversifying your portfolio, rebalancing when the market got smacked in the teeth in, in April, um, you know, on something that no one anticipated, right? Rebalancing our portfolio to our targets buying the stuff that's out of favor with your dividends and interest when they're out of favor and, and watching things like pipelines and emerging markets and small cap value just shoot through the roof and watch your portfolio values jump up. I'll tell you what, the best advertisement for paying capital management's asset allocation strategy, our A to B process was 2020. Well, I think also the thing to think about here is, is you know, we, we have a saying, cash is trash. Um, if you look at what you're earning right now on your money market fund, well, you're getting cash right now, you're actually getting nothing. And we just talked about inflation, cost of living goes up. So I think the first thing is, and we see this all the time because we review probably about 50 to 60 portfolios a month, is a lot of investors have just been sitting in cash for a very long time, earning nothing. And there is a risk to earning nothing, right? Your purchasing power gets cut in half every 20 years. So think about every million dollars you have today is worth $500,000 in the future. So sitting in cash, you know, really, you, you know, make no mistake, you are losing money. So I think first off, being invested is a really critical thing, especially with interest rates so low. And Bob, to what you just said is, you know, one thing that we've absolved ourselves from since we started our firm is being able to predict the future. I don't know about you, my crystal ball broke like 20 years ago, unfortunately, when I got into the business. And, you know, we never know what's going to be the best place to be next. And you're going into this year, I couldn't have told you that so far the S&P 500 has basically been flat, but emerging markets are up a couple percent. Uh, our energy pipelines are up 16%. We couldn't have predicted that. But the point is, you know, you want to have money everywhere because it's always going to be unexpected when it finally works. So having a long-term diversified portfolio that's not in cash, I think is really critical and more critical than ever because interest rates are literally at zero. 
Absolutely right. So our next question, we're asking, uh, what's the difference between an accredited investment fiduciary and an RIA, a registered investment advisor? Well, first of all, we're RIAs, we're registered investment advisors. That's, um, we're fiduciaries, which means we put your interest first. Um, believe it or not, the Obama administration tried to pass that as a standard and the banks and the wirehouses fought it. They don't want it. They don't want to put your interest first. <laughs> they want their interest first. Um, so having us as RIAs, registered investment advisors, is critical. Uh, you want a fiduciary. You want somebody who puts your interest first. Now, there's a, an accredited investment fiduciary. That means there's a company called FI360 that you take a 90-day course, and then they say, hey, you're an accredited fiduciary. Uh, Rye, you got some thoughts on that, don't you? Well, it costs $1,600, Bob. So if you feel like okay. your ethics are... <laughs> out of check, you may want to look into doing it. Um, and secondly, yeah, I think the question here becomes, um, you know, if your advisor isn't already, you know, practicing ethical behavior, you probably should reconsider. But I think the key here is fiduciary, right? You know, paying capital management's a fiduciary. Uh, under law, we have to act in your best interest. And a lot of the big firms don't have to. And I think that's a big distinction. And I think, you know, we call it the old school versus the new school. You know, the old school broker model just doesn't really make sense in the modern day because they basically sell you something on a commission and you've got to ask yourself, are they selling this to me because it's in my best interest or because the broker makes money versus, you know, with the fiduciary responsibility that we have, um, we always have to act in your best interest and we're liable for it. So I think that's a cre you know, critical determiner of who you should be working with if you're not working with us already for the record. And, and just for the record, um, as the head of the investment committee, I'm not allowed to make a transaction in my account until we tell all of you uh, and I own everything you own. So when your advisor calls you and makes a change, recommends that we, you know, take some money out of growth and put it into value or we rebalance the portfolio. I'm the last one. I have to wait until all of you are notified. Um, so being a fiduciary really drives me crazy, but uh, I'm glad I want you to know that, you know, when, when people say, Bob, how often do you look at my account? Since I own exactly everything you own, I look at it every second of the day. Um, and so it's never a surprise to me when a client calls up and says, did you see what happened to our, you know, emerging markets last month? I said, yeah, I saw what happened. I watch it every single day. So, so the key is, you know, we truly have to live to that standard and your interests do come first way before Bob's, by the way. So just so we know. Next question comes in from Rocco. He writes in, when Biden and company increase the capital gains tax over 100% for some, oh man, that's high. Won't many sell before it kicks in depressing already, already inflated stock prices? There's a lot to unpack here, Bob. Well, there's a lot to unpack. And I think that um, anytime I've, I've seen any investor invest based on anticipation of an event, you know, whether it's an election, whether it's a tax increase, whether it's, you know, Jupiter's going to hit Mars tonight, you know, people make all kinds of predictions. But even if you're right about your predictions, it doesn't mean the market's going to react the way you think it will. The market's more complex than anything I've ever seen and, and can ever imagine. And it's smarter than all of us because it has a collective wisdom of every investor already baked in a cake. So, you know, when you when you're anticipating a change in tax law, you're anticipating a change in an administration, anticipating a change in the economy, um, be careful what you ask for because the market may not react the way you think it is. Um, I think the best way I can explain that, if you go to a beauty contest and you, you're gonna pick the winner and your idea of beauty doesn't really matter because it's the judge's idea of beauty who's gonna pick the winner. So you have to figure out what's the judge's opinion of who the winner should be, as opposed to your opinion. So when you're trying to invest based on anticipation, you got to figure out how everybody else is going to react to the thing that you're reacting to. In most cases, we're going to be wrong. And just another, just to speak to that too, because we've been getting a lot of questions about capital gains tax. You know, it's kind of a fallacy too, because there really is precedent. If you look in the '80s, they did raise capital gains taxes, and you didn't see a sell-off in the markets. And one of the reasons is we have to remember is it's not us retail investors that drive the market. It's institutions that drive stock prices yeah. and they're not even subject to capital gains tax. <laughs> so it's a non-event. And the second thing I would ask is if you know, they did increase the capital gains tax, well, would I sell my portfolio? In some cases, we have parts of our portfolio paying like 6 7%. Would I sell that to go in cash again, earning right now a half a percent? 
So, you know, there's a, there's a saying out there called Tina, there is no alternative. And I think more than ever right now, I'm hard pressed to think investors and droves are going to sell out of their dividend paying portfolios to sit in cash just because the capital gains rate went up a little bit. So, you know, by and large, to Bob's point, there's probably a good chance, even if we did get a raise in capital gains tax, it's probably not going to have an effect on how the market moves at all. Well, I think the 2020 is a good example of um, not being able to anticipate uh, how the market's going to react or, you know, what's going to happen, right? Nobody, nobody predicted a global pandemic. Nobody predicted a five-week bear market. Nobody predicted a, a bull market that would recover as fast as it did. Um, so I think the, the problem with Anytime you want to act on, on, on a feeling, you have to make two decisions. When do I get out? And then when do I get back in? And I got to tell you, for people that have gotten out of this market in 2020, they're having the hardest time getting back in. Um, matter of fact, they, they probably won't get in until, you know, who knows when. Uh, but you never make up that return. What's better is to stay invested, reallocate your assets, and react to the opportunities that the market presents once it's reacting to the news, as opposed to us figuring it out ahead of time. Yeah, I think to sum that up, market timing is treacherous. <laughs> so we try to avoid it at all cost. Uh, the next question that comes in is anonymous. It comes in, Ryan and Bob, investing is half the equation. How do you plan for using what you've earned in retirement? Your podcasts are all about earnings. We have a podcast. If you ever check it out, simply go to bbullish.com. Um, Let's have some more talk about spending it wisely over a lifetime. And that's a fair point because, you know, a lot of our, our business and for a lot of helping a lot of you is figuring out once you've, you know, built up this, this pile of cash, we'll call it, is basically how do you draw on it over your lifetime? Yeah. And I mean, it's also, you know, running those what if scenarios, um, you know, when we, when we do these reviews from time to time on your, on your asset allocation, your wealth projections, you know, what if we live longer, right? I mean, it's, I don't know about all of you, but I was just amazed at how quickly they were able to develop a vaccine, not just one company, but, you know, three, four, maybe, maybe even a dozen when we're all said and done. So one, one thing I do expect is our life expectancy to continue to expand. Um, and also we have to look at the cost of healthcare going higher. So we, we want to make sure that we have those what if scenarios planned into your projections, not just you know, what did you spend last year? What are you going to spend next year? You know, we want to make sure that we can sustain the, the lifestyle that, we, that we've created and, uh, you know, be able to sustain that portfolio uh, over longer periods of time. And that's a lot of times why we look at, not only look at what you need to spend, but we look at building a portfolio that's very cash flow rich. So if you look at a lot of our, uh, all of our paying capital management portfolios, they pay a lot of income. Um, this goes back to what I had said earlier about, you know, you start thinking about all those hot stocks last year that did really, really well. You know, Apple is up over 70%. It was just, you know, it was, it was the year of growth. And quite frankly, it's been the last couple of years of growth. Um, but the problem is, again, when you just own growth stocks, you're dependent on the market going up every single year. And, you know, we want to have a portfolio because the beautiful thing about when the pandemic hit in March is the income kept coming in. You know, in our diversified portfolio, it pays a lot more income than just growth stocks. You know, we didn't have to sweat it. We knew those income payments were coming in if you're living off your portfolio. And I think that's a really critical point. Um, it's one of the reasons why it's really dangerous just to own one asset class just because it's done really, really well. Because we've learned, you know, if you look back to 99, 2000 was the last time we had a huge move up in growth stocks, tech stocks. At some point, you know, the music does stop. And when it does, it's not pretty. And you've got to have protection in your portfolio. And if you are retired now, you know, you need something to live off of. As Bob, you like to say, you can't buy lunch with relative performance. Yeah, but that being said, Ryan, I don't want you disparaging our growth stocks because, you know, large cap growth has done 18% a year in our portfolio for 10 years. Now, that's 80% above the historical norm. So it's, um, you know, probably not going to be able to sustain that. But uh, just everybody be clear, we have small growth. We have mid-sized company growth and large growth in our portfolio, which has just basically kicked ass for 10 years. So, you know, the other areas where they're paying dividends are catching up, but um, we did have our fair share. And, you know, Apple was a big part of that. Even though you don't see Apple in your portfolio, it's in your large growth portfolio. Okay, next question coming in comes in from Bernice. She writes in, for a while I've been receiving emails alerting me that the banking crisis puts your money at risk and can legally confiscate your deposits without your permission. 
Are either of you aware of this situation? Does it have any teeth in addition to the banking emails with the new administration? I'm very concerned about my investments. Well, first of all, the bank can do that. So that's why they have FDIC insurance up to a quarter million. So anybody's keeping it, you know, larger deposits than 250,000, any bank um, should be, should be where, so, you know, caveat emptor, you know, make sure that that money's diversified. Don't have it all in one CD or one bank, um, you know, because banks can fail uh, even, even in this environment. And I'll just put a caveat there because I know a lot of these emails go out there about how your retirement accounts could be at risk. The government can compensate them. And we actually reached out to our ERISA specialist, someone who designs all the plans for paying capital and management. And you know, he basically said, I've not heard anything about this or any reduction in the protection that qualified retirement plans offer. Um, I'm not necessarily an, an expert in Dodd-Frank, but I know of it. part of its protection is banks allow them the ability to use deposits more broadly than before the financial emergencies or before the, excuse me, during financial emergencies. Regardless, um, at the end of the day, you know, you should have protection and, you know, realistically, you know, you shouldn't see some sort of compensation of your assets. Like that's, that's a very, you know, probably not true. It's probably more of a fear mongering type of email. There's quite a few of those out there, Roy. Yes. Yes, there are. Yes, there are. Um, I have, uh, I have quite a few friends that believe everything they read on the internet. So just, uh, just, <laughs> just be, <laughs> I'm sure we all share that. <laughs> we all have friends like that, that believe everything, everything is absolutely true. You know, like Lincoln invented the internet, you know, so. <laughs> That's actually true, Bob. You can oh, look it up okay. on well, the internet. See, yeah. You got to verify it, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and also just to address the uh, second half of this email too, with the new administration, I'm very concerned about my investments. You know, the way we'd ideally, we ideally the way that we have structured your investments are it's, it's really not about who's in office. And we've talked about this in the past, you know, there's just so many factors and so many decisions that, you know, you have to get through any sort of even a, a Congress that basically, you know, you have the House and you have the, the Senate both under democratic control, um, you know, it's very hard to pass anything. Um, and ideally the portfolio we built, we have a lot of international exposure. We joked about this before, you know, the foreign markets don't care about who's in office in the US. Um, so we have a lot, of, a lot of different asset classes in our portfolio that aren't really highly correlated to necessarily what's going on on Capitol Hill. And I think that's an important point. Um, you know, we're never really at the helm of what's going on, you know, in DC with regards to your portfolio. You're very insulated with the kind of diversification that we built. That's yeah, very true. And, and, you know, I think in, in any administration, the, the president, the Congress, they get more blame when things are bad than they should. And they we get way more credit when things are good. Um, if you guys remember the conference call we did before the, um, the election, we sent out that graph that showed the 100 year history of the stock market. And basically, you know, stocks have been going up since all of us have been alive, since our parents have been alive, since our grandparents have been alive. And over that period of time, you know, we, we put the bar graphs on the on, you know, uh, the bars on the graph that showed, you know, over every four year period, we had a different administration, some were red, some were blue, but the market results were the same. So it was really hard to see that you know, that the person sitting in the White House has any impact on the performance of, of the equity markets or, or the financial markets. So basically what I did was I, I drew a, a positive correlation to markets rising to someone sitting in the White House. doesn't matter what party. Someone has to, as long as someone's <laughs> sitting there, we've been able to make money in the stock market. And I think the biggest surprise on that graph is we were able to show you the GDP growth of certain administrations and the market performance kind of blew my mind when I saw Clinton outperform Ronald Reagan. So, you know, Clinton had better GDP growth and better performance in the stock market than Ronald Reagan did. And, um, you know, I had to read that over three times to believe it. But so, you know, and even if you go back to 2008, when President Obama was elected, um, he had a supermajority, much bigger supermajority than Biden has right now. And, you know, what got passed? Nothing, right? Stock market went up 272%. So we made money. Uh, regardless of who's in Washington and, you know, whatever rules they change, that's our job. Our job is to protect you, you know, from, from these, 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 whatever these new rules are. So, you know, whenever they come out, we'll figure a way. Um, you know, one of the things we've been able to really focus on, you know, over our careers is to make sure we have the most tax efficient portfolio possible. You know, there's a reason why we buy municipal bonds 
in your personal account. There's a reason why we use index ETS because they're tax efficient. They're not distributing gains every year like mutual funds do. Um, you know, the reason we like to put money in the loss bank, whenever there's a decline, we like to sell and, and swap, you know, in the event that, you know, we have to take a gain down the line. Um, you know, we did both this year. So it paid off really well. So we, you know, it's like uh, Nick Semenik, you know, our buddy down in Jacksonville says, you know, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, but don't give them any of ours. Okay. So what we want to make sure if we pay our fair share, we want to make sure you guys keep as much money as you possibly can, because that compounding interest and dividends is going to create more wealth for you over your lifetime. Money saving taxes, Bob, just as green as any money can make invested. I heard that once. Buddy. Yeah. You got it. All right. Next question comes in from Eileen. She asks, as a retiree, how can I not be concerned about the Biden administration's plans for IRAs and 401ks? How can you know what might happen and how can you plan what to do to protect our investments? Makes me want to prepare a spot inside the mattress to protect our future. Well, last time I looked, the mattress doesn't pay great interest rates. Just saying. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it really sucks when you when you buy a new mattress and you forget that you put that money in that spot in the old mattress. <laughs> it could be a pleasant surprise later, but then again, inflation has ravaged uh, that money that's sitting there. So keep that in mind. Um, again, I think this goes back to a lot of the fear mongering out there. And with ERISA, you should have enough protection in place that I don't think the government's going to come in and confiscate your uh, your retirement plans. And you know, the other thing to think about is those Congress men and women have retirement plans too. So you know, they want to keep that wealth as well. So I, you know, I, I think that is more fear mongering. There's a lot of these um, kind of like these phishing emails out there that uh, they, they talk a lot about how the U.S. dollar is is going to be worthless eventually. And you guys may have seen a lot of these emails, but I but I think you know realistically, um, these aren't the concerns we need to have right now. But I do think you know we talked about it before. Inflation is real, um, and I think you know it isn't a joke how much money has been printed. But again having stocks in your portfolio, having inflation hedges is the way to really combat that. It's not sitting in cash where your money's earning nothing because if cost of living continues to go up at a higher rate, you know, you really need your money to grow. It's more pertinent than ever that you have an investment portfolio, especially if we see inflation. Right. I think it's pretty clear. I mean, candidate Biden made a lot of claims and, and one of the things he did say he was going to tax the 401k, but really what Turned out when I clarified it, he's going to change how, you know, your either the tax deferral or the contributions using tax credits. Sounds pretty complex. Don't know if that'll get passed, but like anything else, you know, things get watered down and, um, you know, the members of Congress, they, and, and the Senate, they, they have one job in mind and that's to get reelected. So, you know, they have constituents to answer to. So it's, it's, it's not, uh, not going to be all or one when it comes to these decisions. Again, we'll advise you accordingly once we know. Yep. And last question um, coming in, comes in from Debbie. She writes in, I'm looking to retire in the next three to five years and wondering how best to invest this year. I'm currently have the following allocations, 44% domestic stocks, 15% foreign stocks, 38% bonds, 2% short term. I'm assuming that's cash, 1% other. I think I may need to move more stock into a more stable environment. Um, now, Debbie, you may be a client or may not be a client. I think you are a client. Uh, you know, again, I think you know, the important thing is, and this is actually an important point with how we invest money, is we always invest on your goals. And I like the way Debbie's thinking here because she's thinking she's going to retire another two, three years. And for all of you, we think the same thing. You know, the closer you are to being dependent on your money, it's a good rule of thumb, the less dependent you want to be on risk assets. And I think last year is a perfect example of that. You know, if we had all your money at risk, let's just say Bob got crazy and said, we're only going to own tech stocks. Um, you know, we're not going to own any bonds. You know, we're going to all open up uh, Robinhood accounts, go crazy and speculate. Well, you would have felt pretty bad in March when the market sold off the fastest three weeks ever <laughs> and literally saw your portfolio go down by 40% or your net worth go down in that case by 40%. And you decide you were going to retire that year. So we never want to put you in that position. So I think it is really important. And, you know, Debbie, if you are, I think you believe our client, we'll have one of our advisors, you know, reach out and look over your allocation. But your allocation is very strategic to you based on your goals, based on when you're going to be dependent on your money. And that's something that we update on an annual basis. In fact, you know, you're going to be hearing from your advisors over the next couple of weeks, because for many of you that have been vested with us for a while, well, you know, the market's gone up a lot. 
And to what Bob's you know, point is, we added money to the market back, remember March and April, but it didn't feel very good to add money to the market. And a lot of your allocations now are getting out of line. You know, you're getting to a point, we are getting overweighted in risk assets. And it's our job proactively to always revisit that and make sure that your risk's in check. Yeah, well said, Rob. I mean, the A to B process is, you know, basically a customized asset allocation for each and every one of you. Uh, we'll never be, you know, 100% in any one asset class uh, because it's just too risky and, you know, you don't know the answer. But, you know, one of the things we do is um, literally, Ryan, I think we read everything we can possibly read every day. Uh, we talk every day. We talk every weekend. Um, you know, we, we're on with our advisors two, three days a week talking about, you know, where we think things are headed. Uh, was 2020 turned out to be a fabulous year. Uh, we're off to a great start in 2021. And um, I'm, I'm very optimistic. And, you know, I appreciate, uh, you know, all of you tuning in uh, for a little chat. And if you have any follow-up questions, please email us. We'll be happy to get back to you. Yeah, thank you. We appreciate all of you. And I see it's a lot of clients on the line tonight. Um, it's been a great run. And yeah, we're in the game, as Bob likes to say. So we're, uh, we're in the game and we're looking forward to uh, helping you get to your goals. And we're going to keep at it and we'll do more of these calls and, or Zoom calls in the future. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Have a great evening and thanks for jumping on yeah. for the call tonight. Thank you.